next presenter will be Diane Foster. Great, thanks. That actually was a great lead-in question. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, today about some of more, our more focused um, movement ecology data uh, related to some of the modeling that Scott just introduced us to. So first, I'd like to introduce my co-authors, um, Scott Newman, of course, of FAO, John Takakawa, USGS in California, and Shangming Xiao at the University of Oklahoma. He's a remote sensing uh, scientist and the lead on some of our more recent NIH funding. So um, this debate on how wild birds might be involved in the spread of highly pathogenic avian influenza, particularly H5N1 is a model that we were using, began at Qinghai Lake in 2005. So if, recall, if you recall, H5N1 emerged in 96 or 97. It was stamped out. And then it reemerged in eight countries in Asia simultaneously in 2003, late 2003. And then it circulated in 2004 within that region. But in 2005, for the first time in history, uh, there was a large outbreak of H5N1 in wild birds. And it happened here up on the very remote region of the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau here at Qinghai Lake. More than 6,300 wild birds died in this refuge, and more than half of them were bar-headed geese. <clears throat> so just to give you a little bit of background um, on wild birds and poultry and the cycle of avian influenza. So wild water birds are the known reservoirs for low pathogenic avian influenza viruses. So the viruses that they have co-evolved with over millions of years, they're typically not lethal. But they are the source of, of avian influenza viruses. Um, and so here, here are the wild birds. And what happens, we think, is that a low path virus may um, um, enter into um, a high population situation such as poultry. And there it may amplify up into a pathogenic form. And rarely, um, not until H5N1 has it spilled back to wild birds, normally it stops here within the poultry system and may affect humans and poultry. But now with H5N1, we, have, we do have some spillback into the wild birds. And so we were interested in trying to understand um, the movements of wild birds from some of these hotspot regions of H5N1. And what you're seeing here is a general map of H5N1 um, uh, outbreaks in wild birds as well as in poultry. Poultry is, is orange. So H5N1 uh, still. Um, is restricted to the old world, but, but you can see it has um, affected a, a pretty large region, more than 65 countries within this area of Asia, Europe, and Africa. And so we wanted to study the movements of wild birds um, in relation to these outbreak areas. And uh, here's a slide that Martin showed this morning on the U UNFAO-led program to try and understand movement ecology of, of wild birds. And through this program, we've marked more than 550 birds from 12 different countries, our strongest data sets being here in China, whether they're birds that were marked in Mongolia or in China, um, also in India, moving through the Central Asia flyway versus the East Asian flyway here. But we also have birds marked in Africa, um, Egypt, um, and a few other countries in between. So some of the questions we really wanted to know is, um, what is the involvement of wild birds in the spread of highly pathogenic avian influenzas? And how can telemetry help us answer these questions? So some of, some of the focal questions are, from the outbreak areas, where might these birds migrate? What is the timing of their migration? When do they leave? Um, how long does it take them to migrate? Where are their stopover locations? How long are they at those stopover locations? Can infected birds migrate? Um, do poultry and waterfowl intermix? and our movements correlated with outbreaks. And so when we started this work back in 2005, 2007, there was almost no information on the ecology of wild birds and how either their movement patterns um, within Asia or these regions, or how they might be affected by a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. So we were starting almost at ground zero. So um, we have used pretty much all of the tools that have been out there um, available to us from looking at tracks, um, overlays of tracks, MCPs, fixed kernel densities for the wintering or 
um, breeding areas, browning and bridges for the migration, and um, more recently, these 40 UDs and dynamic browning and bridges. One of the early studies that came out by Newman, um, these were whooper swans that were marked in Mongolia um, during their molting um, period, so before their southern migration. And here we're looking at just the track overlays of the birds coming down from Mongolia, and they are overlaid with the outbreaks, H5N1 outbreaks in South Korea with buffers associated around them. And so we can see a pretty clear spatial overlap. Uh, between the whooper swans and the outbreaks. However, if you look more closely at the timing of when the outbreaks occurred, you will see that the outbreaks actually preceded the arrival of the whooper swans um, as they entered into their wintering grounds. Here we're on the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau. This is Qinghai Lake. One of the really neat things that we learned just in the ecology of the 30 bar-headed geese that were marked here is that almost all of them, 95% of them, wintered in this area right here, which is Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. That was not known before. There were very few banding records, about three of them. And it was thought that they mainly wintered in India. So um, this was monumental in itself. And uh, here I'm just showing, showing you MCPs of, this is the breeding areas of Qinghai Lake, some of the important um, reserve areas that are also their stopovers. And then here is Lhasa. And the yellow dots are the outbreaks of um, H5N1. Uh, this one actually doesn't show them coded by wild vers birds versus poultry for the outbreaks. But almost all of the outbreaks down here in the wintering grounds are in poultry. And so um, we were able to show, even just <laughs> visually here, that we've got these wild birds that are migrating down, wintering in wetlands or agricultural fields that are associated with some of the poultry farms. And that is um, a very open um, <clears throat> form of uh, potential risk exposure to the wild birds. Here we're looking at um, ruddy shell ducks that were marked at Qinghai Lake um, and MCPs. Here's the breeding ground, some of the stopover areas. And their wintering locations were Bangladesh, Myanmar, and uh, Western China. And on the right side here, you're seeing some of the fixed kernel home range um, breeding grounds and wintering grounds. It scaled out a little bit too much. If you zoomed in, you would actually see these kernels being pretty tightly overlaid with the outbreaks in poultry mainly in the southern part of the flyway. And here are the migration corridors using um, the horn, brownie, and bridge movement models. Oops. Um, this is the East Asian flyway, so birds that were marked at um, Poyang Lake in the, in the eastern part of China, an area with a lot of rice paddy farming, a lot of duck farming, and a lot of people um, all integrated on the landscape. So 32 waterfowl, here are the Browning Bridge models for the falcated teal, um, grouping of other teal species, widgeons. And then here, this is really interesting, the Chinese spot bill. Some of them are migratory. But here we have a wild bird that is resident within this area. And I'll follow up on this in a slide towards the end that shows overlap with poultry. So in this analysis, we used some correlation models, um, AIC selection. And what we found was that the outbreaks were most highly correlated with um, latitude and as well as poultry density, but not necessarily with the bee bud or the wild bird um, migration corridors. <clears throat> and here, this graphic helps to explain this, I think. So um, the, the purple line here are um, the, the outbreaks. So we've got timeline here, August <laughs> through July, and then uh, latitude on the y-axis. So what this is showing is that the outbreaks preceded the arrival of the migratory waterfowl. But um, the, I guess the, um, the release of the 40 UD um, really helped us advance our modeling because it, it allowed our, our models to become more precise and that we could look at um, the, the different timing segments of migration and to link those more directly with the timing of the outbreak. So break it apart based on 
the seasonal chronology of the wild birds. <coughs> and I just want to show you this before I, I show you the next few slides. This is a really striking figure. You're seeing poultry densities in the brown. And um, so here's Poyang Lake. This is China. And you can just see there, there really isn't much poultry in the Central Asia Flyway. This is the Tibetan Plateau, Mongolia. But as you go farther south within the Central Asia Flyway, you do have poultry within India. And uh, so let me try and play this movie. So this is a 4D UD. I'm sorry. I should call them 3D UDs um, because we're not using elevation. But here we've got space and time. And you, you're seeing the migration of the bar-headed geese in relation to the poultry. And so we're right now we're in July, so they've migrated up to the breeding grounds. And um, soon here you'll see them as they move back down. And visually you can see the correlation of um, domestic bird outbreaks and the movements of the wild birds. And again, the same thing visually here, latitude um, and time. The purple showing the wild birds and the red showing the outbreaks in poultry. So as you're in the southern end of the flyway where you actually have a lot of duck farming, and, but you also have the movement of these wild birds, that's the area where the highest risk, risk exposure is for the wild birds and possibly for um, new evolution from low path viruses going into the domestic system. And uh, one thing that we did try and do was look at the phylogenetics. Um, and, and this is something that we need to work on further. Uh, this is the same study, um, the same paper, but it, it showed, um, not, didn't exactly match the phylogenetics, showed a southward movement of virus evolution. So part of that could be due to um, the biased availability of isolates available within the, the gene sequences, gene sequence um, databases. But this is something that we think is important to try and look at the virology as well as um, the movement ecology. Um, I'm going to move forward on this. We're, we're also using 3D UDs for the Poyang Lake region and um, overlaying them with outbreaks. Um, and in the Central Asia flyway, we're using the dynamic Brownian bridge models. This is under prep, but also um, overlaying them with other um, um, environmental factors, disease risk factors, poultry densities, and market chain analyses, where that data is available, if that data is still generally lacking. And um, let's see. So um, I want to just go back to some of the information we learned from the raw data itself. and. Um, so here, originally, some of the early studies that came out that tried to help us understand the movement of virus um, within the region was based on genetics of uh, virology. And this Chen paper in 2006 hypothesized that wild birds may have moved virus from Poyang Lake to Qinghai Lake. And here we were able to show from our tracking data that this is probably not the case. This is probably not how the virus moved from these two regions, um, in between these two regions. And, um, also, um, just understanding how quickly birds may be able to migrate from one region to the next. From Lhasa to Qinghai Lake, some birds made it within five days. That's the amount of time that a bird may be asymptomatic, so they may be infected with virus, but not showing any symptoms yet, so may be able to um, complete a migration. So here we're showing more potential for wild birds to possibly be able to move virus, whether it's short distance or medium, medium distance. And looking across all of our um, tracking data, this is similar information showing that um, most of the birds move their maximum distances, 300 to 1,600 kilometers, within one to four days. And um, very rarely do you find uh, wild birds that are healthy and infected with a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. But there is one study here uh, where a white-faced whistling duck uh, was healthy but had um, tested positive for highly pathogenic H5N2. <coughs> so this is a rare case showing that a bird might be able to migrate being infected with a highly pathogenic virus. Also, um, we've had uh, about 90 or so bar-headed geese through the different studies that have been um, marked and we've been able to map out the different subpopulations. So this is something else that you should be considering um, in these disease studies is that 
looking at a bar-headed goose may not be the same if you're looking at one in um, China versus Mongolia. So birds from Mongo Mongolia had the longest migrations all the way down into um, India, whereas the China birds, mainly Qinghai Lake to Lhasa, and then some other subpopulations here. And um, also we can learn from um, just looking at the, the high-resolution tracking data that um, the southern migrations may not always be the same as the northward migration. So again, timing is very important when you're talking about the movements of wild birds. And um, also we have developed interface models between risk models um, highlighting areas where poultry and wild bird risk of, of disease transmission may be greatest. And the telemetry data has been able to show us that on the landscape, yes, wild birds and domestic birds do come into contact with each other. This is uh, Qinghai Lake showing um, outbreaks of avian influenza in the same time of bar-headed goose moving back and forth between the natural wetlands and the uh, poultry farms. Here is Poyang Lake. We've got marked wild birds within the refuge. In the red, we have got GPS data loggers on poultry and trying to understand the movements um, and the overlap between poultry and wild birds in this system. And again, Scott talked a little bit about this. Um, the, the rice cropping and the domestic duck farming are, are closely tied to cycles within the system. But then we also have uh, wild migratory birds entering the system early as the first domestic ducks are being produced and leaving, uh, I'm sorry, leaving as in, in the spring and then entering in the fall where you've got um, birds that are most immunologically naive and may have the, the highest risk of transferring disease. And so um, movements of waterfowl were informative in understanding these outbreaks, but they were improved as we were able to improve our, our modeling and be able to incorporate the time component within the models. In some cases, there was spatial agreement of outbreaks, um, but it depend, differed temporarily and within the different flyways. And um, being able to understand more about the ecological traits of the waterfowl really helped us understand um, the process in our modeling. So, um, suggestions for the group here, um, we would like to, uh, we would be welcome to have input on other factors we should be examining in relation to wild bird movement for ecology and disease. Um, we're really interested in understanding more about the market chains. We, we would, you know, one idea is to put data loggers on uh, some of the poultry and follow them through the market system. This type of information really still isn't out there. And um, can we be more efficient about looking at the migration patterns of the, the wild birds that we're studying? Thank you. I know it's tight, so. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm curious, actually, since there are cultural differences in, in these uh, area regions we study, say, for example, in India, the food habits are mostly poultry, but only beef or pork is very limited. Mm -hmm. And in China, it's probably the opposite. You have pork and chicken and poultry is consumed in sort of equal proportions of all these parts. So uh, I, I wonder if these habits also sort of change uh, the way one looks at things, uh, how poultry consumption is sort of increasing, especially in countries like India where people are making more money yeah. and they, they switch to. I think that's true across sort of much of Asia. In fact, yes. um, Domestic ducks and chickens are really important for, for China and, and many parts of Asia as well. Right. But I think that's definitely true um, that the consumption of meat is on the rise. And so there were uh, 14, uh, 14 million ducks raised just in the Poyang Lake area you know, each year. So um, yeah, that's an important factor that, that we're interested in looking at in our models. We, we do incorporate poultry density or livestock density within our models. But on the other hand, I think there's a maybe principle to say that a certain category of bees has conservation concerns and more people in the population increase, consumption increase, habitats go down. And I wonder what's the conservation trade of all these species. And in future, as things change now, I still think that um, the, the main form of, of highly pathogenic 
avian influenza virus transmission is through the poultry system. But the wild birds do seem to play a role, either um, at stopover locations or, or smaller distances. And um, it really does vary depending on what species you're talking about. So how long they can shed virus, um, how susceptible they are, how much virus they shed. And those are good points to be brought up. And I think that we, we need to know more information about each of those individual wild bird species. Yeah. 